Many sci-fi fans who grew up in the 1970s might point to Doctor Who as being the scariest show on television around that time, although the same decade certainly brought many, many other candidates for that honour. For me, however, one of the unsung kings of 70s TV horror was Space 1999. Even though I didn't grow up in the 70s and didn't see this show until the late 1990s, it's amazing how effective the show's scariest moments still are even today. Many people still have fond memories of being scared by this show, so it's time to celebrate Space 1999's Top 10 Scariest Moments. I should mention straight away that most of the scenes on this list come from the first season, as while the second series did occasionally try to scare its audience with scenes of death, violence, madness, disease, and creepy, possibly creepy, not sure really if they're creepy or not aliens, it was on the whole a much more family-friendly show than it had been the previous year. Not so the first season, however. The first season was a series that understood the importance of building tension and atmosphere, and knew that sudden jump scares were nowhere near as effective as letting the fear build in the mind of the viewers, and then taking it even further than they were expecting it to go. Obviously, as always, all of this is subjective, but here are my top 10 scariest moments from Space 1999. Number 10. Jackie Crawford from Alpha Child. This episode really is a game of two halves, the first of which is pretty effective in terms of horror, as the first baby born on Alpha grows into a five-year-old boy within a matter of minutes. That alone is a really effective little bit of horror, and it once again shows that the Alphans can only be allowed to be happy for about ooh, five minutes tops before something awful turns up to ruin their day. This crazy life we lead. Nobody really knows how it's affecting us physically. Not long term. Speaking of awful, unfortunately the story then kind of goes off the rails quite dramatically in the second half, when Julian Glover turns up with a bad haircut to play the adult Jackie dressed in, well tinfoil underpants. I was very happy with my birth. But the first half is still a genuinely effective and suspenseful mystery plot, as the young Jackie charms everyone on the base while covertly gathering information on Alpha to help prepare for his people's impending invasion. What makes this work is that the kid playing the young Jackie is really good in the role. He does look like a sweet, innocent little boy most of the time, but when he needs to be creepy and unsettling, he can certainly deliver the goods. I saw him smile, and it sent a shiver up my spine, almost as if he were mocking his mother to death. I especially like that Koenig is the only one who can see Jackie's act for what it really is. That adds another slightly nightmarish element to the whole thing. I think he's fooled all of us. While it's probably fair to say that this isn't quite as strong an episode as it potentially could have been, seeing the miracle of birth twisted into something as creepy and unsettling as this definitely makes at least the first half of this episode worth a look. It just kind of watch the second half through the cracks in your fingers, otherwise you have to watch Jackie killing his mother and then making out with a reanimated corpse. Ugh. Next one. Whichever way you look at it, their behaviour is suspicious. Number 9. The Death of Lowry from Mission of the Darians. This scene, while reasonably horrifying in its own right, is made even more chilling by just how exactly it fits into the larger story. While exploring the seemingly deserted spaceship Daria, Helena Russell and security guard Bill Lowry are captured by the survivors of Level 7, a primitive tribe with a passionate hatred for anything they consider MUTANT! And whenever they find a MUTANT! They throw them into this disintegration chamber right here and turn it on destroying the victim as slowly and painfully as possible. Help me! Don't you rush me! But hey, clearly Lowry's gonna be okay, right? I mean, sure, he's not a regular character or anything, but oh, you just have to take one look at him to see that he's perfectly... Newton! Perfectly screwed, yes. Lowry is thrown into the chamber and disintegrated, all the while screaming in vain for Helena to help him. Not sure what exactly he was expecting her to do, but still, it's a pretty nasty way to die. Except that this chamber doesn't just kill the people placed inside it, but instead breaks down their molecules and recycles them as food. 
So yes, cheerful chappy Bill Lowry has just become part of the Darien food chain so that the Daria's ruling elite can continue to survive. Our experience on this ship has taught us the truth, the only truth, survival. Look, you can't justify using the living bodies of your own people to survive. And if that isn't a nightmarish enough concept for you, then hey, how about a trip to a corpse farm to see the harvesting process in action? This episode is remarkably effective in establishing the horror of this process in the mind of the viewer. The word cannibalism is never once uttered, but it doesn't need to be. All we need are a handful of disturbing images, and our imaginations can fill in the rest. The point is especially driven home at the end of the episode, as Lowry's absence is keenly felt among the Alphans as they return to base. There's no need for any great speech, just a shot of an empty chair and Helena's memory of the sound of Bill's whistling. Lowry wasn't one of the main characters, but somehow we feel his loss just as keenly as we would have if one of them had ended up being broken down for food. If the same thing happened on Alpha, would you have chosen differently? Remind me to tell you sometime. Number 8. Torrens meets Psyche from The Metamorph. The second season only occasionally dabbled in horror, but nowhere was it quite as effectively realised as in this scene from its very first episode. Brian Blessed has built what may look like some kind of elaborate fizzy drink dispenser, but is in fact Psyche, a biological computer that he hopes will restore his planet to its former glory. There's just one problem, where to find the mental energy to power this machine? His daughter Maya believes that he has been inviting passing aliens to engage in brief mental contact with Psyche, but in reality he needs much more than just that. You fed their minds to that machine. There is no other energy source. So yes, despite its slightly goofy appearance, Psyche is actually a brightly coloured nightmare powered by the captured minds and intelligences and imaginations of all the people unfortunate enough to pass by Psycon. And what happens to them after their minds have been squeezed dry? Yes, they're sent to work in the mines, of course, until they eventually drop dead. Although Koenig is able to save most of his friends from having their minds drained into Psyche, Alphan pilot Ray Torrens isn't so lucky. The scene in which his mind is drained is rather unsettling for several reasons, one of which being that there is no dialogue at all, just the extremely loud and rather awful noise of Psyche doing its thing. What also helps is that actor Nick Brimble is really selling the moment as Torrens' mind is drained. He gets no dialogue throughout this episode, so he really goes for it here, conveying the full agony of someone literally having their mind ripped out of their body. He looks scared and scary all at the same time, and when the other Alphans find him put to work in the mines, they can see for themselves the full horror of Psyche. He doesn't know us. That's right, no memories, no emotions, and evidently no control of his bowels. Ugh. Number 7. The death of Mike Baxter from End of Eternity. One of the many criticisms levelled against Space 1999 is that the characters are bland, uninteresting, and don't feel especially real, which is something I've never quite managed to understand. Okay, I can kind of agree with it to some extent on certain occasions, but really, there's no more or less character work than you'd find in any other action series made around the same time. In fact, one of the main arguments I'd make against this criticism is in the presentation of the show's guest characters. We've already seen the show's attempts to make the death of a random security guard genuinely affecting, and now End of Eternity gives us Mike Baxter, a pilot who is permanently grounded when his optic nerve is damaged after an explosion. What's clever here is that we don't need any dialogue to establish how much of a loss this is to him. The layout of his quarters make it very clear that flying is his entire life. That's a pretty good achievement for a show that many people would have you believe is populated by cardboard cutouts. At the same time, the Alphans are having to deal with Balor, a psychotic immortal alien with a particular fondness for causing death and destruction in the most twisted and brutal ways imaginable. Eventually, these two plotlines converge as Balor introduces himself to Mike. What do you want with me? Perhaps I can help you. And then he apparently just kind of leaves, seemingly not having harmed Mike at all, at least on the surface. And then... 
what makes this scene stand out is in the way the attack is shot. We don't see Koenig being hit by the plane, we are Koenig being hit by the plane, and we are the plane itself being repeatedly pounded into Koenig's face. By putting the viewers themselves in the position of both the victim and the attacker, it helps to make the violence of the scene far more intimate and horrifying than just outright showing it. Not that they apparently weren't prepared to do that, as although we only see Koenig's bloodied hand in the episode, these photos show that some gruesome injury makeup was applied to Martin Landau for this scene. Yet look at me now, there was a mark on me. Oh, but wait, because we're not done yet. <laughs> so yeah, that just happened. Next one. Number 6. Mateo's Ghost from the Troubled Spirit. This is one of several episodes on this list that pulls off the extremely effective trick of turning Moonbase Alpha into a haunted house, with the lights turned down low and inhuman horrors lurking around every corner. Dan Mateo and his friends in Alpha's hydroponics department have attempted to increase the base's crop yield by experimenting with telepathic communication with the plants themselves. Now, I don't know either. The experiment is a failure, but it does produce something. Unfortunately, that something then goes on a killing spree throughout the base, murdering anybody that Mateo has a particular grudge against. The senior staff decide that, hey, if a seance brought this thing into their world in the first place, then maybe another seance could send it back again, because that's just TV logic. But it's a totally esoteric supposition. Unfortunately, what they discover is that this force isn't just linked to Mateo, it is Matteo, his scarred and vengeful ghost returned to prevent the incident that created him. As with many concepts in Space 1999's first season, this episode raises an idea that it doesn't really have any proper explanation or solution for, so this one just decides to go full ghost story instead, and the results are extremely effective. It's beautifully directed throughout, and takes the very wise decision not to show too much of the ghost's true form until it absolutely has to. Instead, we feel its influence, see its shadow on the wall, and are constantly unsettled by the electric sitar that plays throughout the story. When we finally do see the ghost, the makeup is suitably graphic and adds another element of horror to the story. The central idea of a man being haunted by his own ghost due to his well-intentioned mistake is definitely a strong one, and Giancarlo Prete gives a strong performance in both roles. There aren't too many episodes among the Jerry Anderson series that can truly be called ghost stories, but this one has to be the best of the bunch. My life after death. The Death of Dr. Rowland from Death's Other Dominion. This episode runs relatively low on horror content for the most part, as the Alphans discover an ice planet inhabited by the survivors of a lost Earth expedition. They've built themselves a community here, albeit one with a dark side, as Dr. Cabot Rowland, Brian Blessed again, has been carrying out experiments on his own people to try to discover the secret of the immortality that they now possess. We shall be as gods in the universe. Gods. Gods. But aside from the sight of the victims of these experiments, there haven't really been any outright scares. So as the end of the episode approaches and Dr. Rowland accompanies Koenig and the others back to Alpha to invite all of the Alphans to join them on the planet, you find yourself looking at your watch and thinking, hang on a second, there's only two minutes left to go here. How can all this possibly get resolved so quickly? And then this happens. <laughs> what makes this scene so effective is not only the strong element of gore, but the fact that you really don't see it coming. Up until this point, the episode has been largely confined to long, talky scenes on the ice planet. Not that that's a bad thing, in fact, this is one of the strongest episodes of the first season. 
But aside from the vague ravings of Jack Tanner, the mission commander and first of Dr. Rowland's experiment victims, there's never been any suggestion that leaving the planet would kill anybody, much less any hints of such a gruesome death. And what's also quite striking about all this is that we don't actually need to see the moment of his death. We get to see the aftermath, and that's more than enough. In fact, when this episode was repeated on BBC Two in 1998, more than 20 years after it was first broadcast, it attracted a flurry of complaints for being broadcast in an early evening time slot. And when a scene is still scary decades after it was first broadcast, the people responsible for making it had to be doing something right. Death has dominion. Number four. This is Commissioner Simmons returning home after 75 years. Simmons returns home from Earthbound. The very first episode of Space 1999 ended with a few things unresolved, with the number one question being what would the Alphans find when they reached the planet Meta? Well, if they did make it to Meta, we unfortunately didn't get to see it, so it's on to our second question. What happened to Commissioner Simmons? Yes, when the moon was blown out of orbit, this visiting politician was stranded on board along with the rest of the crew, and after being such a strong presence in the first episode, it's odd that the show simply forgot he existed for the next three. Take for instance the survival ship launched to escape the Black Sun. There's no way he wouldn't have been all over that. Thankfully, somebody remembered that Simmons existed and came up with an episode that would write him out of the show permanently. And what an exit they gave him. The arrival of an unknown spacecraft on the moon gives the Alphans hope when it turns out that the peaceful aliens inside, the Kaldorians, are heading for Earth. With one spare hibernation unit aboard the ship, Simmons forces Koenig to let him be the one to go home, and that appears to be the end of that. Only when Simmons eventually awakens after his 75-year voyage to Earth, he finds that not only are the Kaldorians still asleep, but that Earth isn't responding to his calls. And then he realises that actually it's only been a couple of hours since he left the moon. But the ship is now out of range of the moon, and he can't wake any of the Kaldorians, and he can't get out of the box. Ever. No matter how much he screams, nobody will ever be coming to help him. It, it, just ignore the fact that nobody told these extras that the cameras were rolling, because that totally spoils the entire scene. Again, the real horror of this one comes from what we don't see. We're left to imagine Simmons dying an extremely low and horrible death in that casket, probably going mad in the process. And even if he could get out of the cabinet, where's he going to go? It's almost a Twilight Zone-style ending in terms of how bleak it gets in its moral judgement on this character. I mean, sure, he was kind of annoying, but all he really wanted was just to go home. And he got to. Oh, and just to make all this even more ghoulish, I love that the episode ends with a shot of the Kaldorian spaceship flying away while happy, triumphant music is playing. You guys really are just messing with this poor man now, aren't you? Number three. Anton Zoreff from Force of Life. This is another episode that runs with the idea of Alpha as a haunted house, this time stalked by a man who is slowly being taken over by an alien energy force that has fused with his body. Anton Zoreff seems like a fairly decent sort of chap, dedicated to his job, has plenty of friends, and loves his wife dearly, which makes him just as much a victim in this episode as anyone. The alien force within Anton begins draining the energy from around him, first in small ways, but soon the bodies begin to pile up as Zoreth loses more and more of himself to whatever it is that has taken him over. Realising his need for energy, the Alphans cut power throughout the base and eventually this forces Zoreth to the nuclear generator area, where this happens.
Yes, it's a fairly nasty way to die, but I suppose they didn't really have many other options at this point. Oh my god, what's this? He's alive. A laser. A laser regenerator. This single moment, possibly more than any other, encapsulates how effective this show can be at its scariest. When I first saw this as a kid, yeah, it scared me, but not enough that it made me want to stop watching. What really sells the horror element of this episode is that by the end of the story, it becomes apparent that this force wasn't evil as such. All of this was just part of its life cycle, and the deaths of all those Alphans were just something that it had to do in order to survive. Except that the results of that process are now shown here at their most brutal. Anything that was left of Zoreth is now gone. Anything that was human is now gone. And all we have left is a scarred, blackened husk of something empowered by the laser blast, yet still hungry for more energy. I am amazed that this was shown on TV uncut back in the 70s. I mean, those eyes! Force of Life is one of my favourite episodes of Space 1999, precisely because it is so unsettling. It's superbly directed, with several nightmarish scenes and some more unusual music. Also, seeing the usual bright, gleaming corridors of Alpha plunged into darkness as Zoreth makes his way around the base only ups the horror. Ian McShane gives a terrific performance as a good man corrupted by something he can't control or even identify, which perfectly highlights the multiple levels of horror that this episode operates on. In fact, you might even call it chilling. Number two. The virus infection? The virus infection. The virus infection from Breakaway. This may seem like an odd choice, but hey, it's my list, and this is the one that genuinely scared me the most on first viewing. I've always found sudden violent madness to be rather unsettling, especially if it's someone you know. You're just going about your job and your friend seems perfectly fine, and then BAM! They've totally lost the plot and are trying to kill you. True, I'm not too sure that magnetic radiation would affect a person's brain in the way it does in this episode, but then again, this show did seem to have something of a fetish when it came to brain damage. 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 Damage to the brain. Possible brain hemorrhage. Two brains. You must not touch my brain. Salad on the brain. There was very little brain tissue left to examine. Most of it had melted. It's unsettling enough to see Nordstrom and Collins suddenly go berserk, but the cataracts are also rather scary too. Anything I related is also something else that has always got to me. However, the one scene that I'll admit I still find just a little bit uncomfortable to watch even today is this one where Koenig goes to see his old friends Warren and Sparkman in the isolation ward. Now keep in mind that these two men were meant to be taking the Metaprobe, the so-called giant leap for mankind, out into space, and now they're just vegetables being kept alive only by life support systems. It highlights the show's ruthlessly pessimistic streak with regard to space travel, but also it just looks so creepy seeing their scarred, blind faces bathed in that blue light. What's worse is that there are several behind-the-scenes photos taken during this scene of the actor playing Sparkman actually smiling on set, which makes the whole thing even more creepy. It's like he's been to hell, but he's come back to tell all his friends about the fun times they can have there. Oh, stop smiling, you creepy, weird zombie man! You're freaking me out! As I said, if I were ranking this list solely on what genuinely scared me personally throughout the 48 episodes of Space 1999, then this would be number one. But I would be most remiss not to acknowledge that for many people, one particular episode still stands out more than 40 years later as the scariest thing they've ever seen. We've one more slot to be filled, and if you know this show, you know exactly what's coming. And if you don't, well, I'll be interested to see what you make of this. <laughs> Number one. Dragon's Domain. All of it. 
Yes, couldn't not talk about the episode that's one of the first things anybody mentions when talking about this series, or even scary episodes of television generally. Dragon's Domain presents us with the story of yet another in the long line of Earth's failed deep space missions. But this time we actually get to see the events of the voyage unfold through a flashback. Everything is going fine until the crew of the Ultra Probe come across this unsettling sight. It's like a graveyard of spaceships. Thank you. And they make the unfortunate decision to dock with one of the seemingly abandoned ships. They find... And somebody watching this just wet themselves. Now, if you're not familiar with this scene, then you may be surprised that this thing scared so many people. After all, it's just sitting there, waving its arms around, and you don't even need high definition to be able to see the wires moving those arms, but that's just part of the trick. In fact, I'd happily argue that this monster still works precisely because of that. On first sight, it does look goofy, it can't even move, but this is only the beginning. Because this thing doesn't need to move. This thing can hypnotize you into throwing yourself toward it. Still thinking that this looks a bit cheesy? Okay, well, how about this? Once it has you, it drags you kicking and screaming into the mouth of hell before vomiting up your steaming carcass a few moments later. I'll just repeat that. It vomits up your steaming carcass. And then it moves on to your friends. One by one, almost the entire crew of the Ultra Probe fall to this thing, each powerless to do anything, and each knowing exactly what's going to happen to them. And since these aren't characters we know, we don't know for sure that they'll all get out alive, which they do not. That's where this scene retains its effectiveness to this day. The performances of each of these actors do so much to sell the horror of this thing. Barbara Kellerman in particular seems genuinely terrified of this thing, and watches in horror until there's nobody left for the creature to consume except her. Oh, but wait, here comes Captain Tony. Surely he'll save her, and she's gone. Tony escapes and heads back to Alpha, where nobody believes his story. That's another superb way to build the tension throughout the rest of the episode, because we all saw it too. We know he's not crazy, and we know that what happened to Tony's crew is also what happened to the crews of every single one of those ships. A child watching this could easily equate Tony's situation to telling a parent that there's a monster under the bed and not being believed. Heck, the fact that it sits immobile in a doorway means that it could turn up anywhere at any time. So when we see that mass graveyard cross the moon's path, we also know that that terrible thing is likely still over there, alone and hungry. As I said, I saw this show in the 90s, so I cannot imagine how horrific this thing must have seemed back in the 70s. While it's true that the passage of time has perhaps reduced the scare factor of this thing somewhat, the monster still looks suitably nasty close up, especially those smaller tentacles underneath that pull its victims to their fiery death. And there's just enough detail to fire the imagination as to what else might be lurking behind the door. Also, the fact that it never stops roaring makes it all the more nightmarish. And of course, we mustn't forget, it vomits up your steaming carcass. Dragon's Domain is not the only Space 1999 episode to feature strong horror elements, but nothing else in the series is as prolonged as this one incredible scene. The acting, the lighting, the sound design, everything comes together perfectly to create something truly unique. This creature has haunted the nightmares of many, many people for decades. And for something to still be able to scare its audience even after 40 years is extremely impressive. In fact, I think I can hear something. Oh, bother. Right, um... Somebody find me a really tiny pickaxe! That's how you kill this thing! Gah! Get off! <laughs>